This week on Arizona Illustrated, solar powered racing. They said, hey, we need a driver. You want to join? And I said, sure. And I ended up falling in love with it. Wildcat med students tune up. The Rogue Theater brings Celia to Tucson. Going back and counting the minutes and seconds of their future. And an Arizona profile. Welcome to Arizona Illustrated. I'm Tom McNamara. For the past six years, high school students from across the state have been gathering south of Tucson to race each other with go-karts they built themselves. But there's a catch. These hot rods are powered by a source from out of this world. The race started back in 2010, and we started out with three teams, increased to five the next year. The year after that, we increased to 10, and this year we have 14 go-karts and 12 high schools who are participating. All right, can you help me with this? My name is Mackenzie Cushman. Uh, I go to Center for Academic Success. This is CAS Solar Go-Kart Team. Well, this is the modified cart. Uh, this is a standard chassis, only we are allowed to modify it any way we want. And what we did was we tried to shave as much weight off of it as we could. Uh, and what I hope to accomplish this year is to, well, one, win. <laughs> and B, I want to uh, kind of see how far I can test the cart to see if it can go any faster, if it can go longer, if it can just power through. Get an adjustable wrench. Oh, I'm Josh Caballero, I'm from Desert Vista High School, and uh, I'm the driver for the Desert Vista Solar Squad. This is the, the Maker class, which is the highest, uh, most difficult class at Racing the Sun, where we have to construct our entire car from scratch, just based on some regulations and guidelines that we have to follow. We really wanted to optimize our power efficiency from last year, so what we did to do that is we moved up to bigger tires, these are more efficient in terms of uh, rolling friction and they also go faster. In addition to that, we've also added a bicycle transmission so we could give the motor an easier time uh, going uphill and accelerating. And we also added a bunch of power meters to determine what's happening with the car at any given point. We can determine the motor RPM, the power consumption of the motor, the power input from the panel, as well as the uh, speed we're going at currently. Wire cutters, anybody? Yeah, I got it. Speed check. On race day, I am surprised to see how many teams have worked until midnight <laughs> the night before, worked around the clock to get their carts up and running, and they actually get here and race. And I'm so happy when they are, they're smiling, they're giving themselves high fives, and they've had such a great time working as a team on this project. The drivers, let's get in the carts so we can get start getting lined up for the safety inspections. The teams come in the morning and they go through a series of checkpoints. It includes safety checkpoints with our mentors who are industry volunteers, um, and then a brakes and maneuverability and a weight check. So they have to weigh at least 100 pounds to get out on the track. And then they go through a series of the safety checks include like a make sure they have their safety belt correct, make sure that they have the batteries and all the whole electrical system wired correctly. Well, everyone, again, thank you for coming today. We're going to do a quick track walk. Uh, we'll talk about it some more, and we want you guys to know what to do in case your vehicle breaks on the track. Right. Come on, guys, we're, we'll head out there as if we were actually going to do a lap. These past couple of days have been kind of rough because we've had a lot of problems, but yesterday we met at our school and we worked out all of the kinks that we could find, and I actually have pretty good confidence in this part that it'll work.
looks like we're getting ready for the next race here. I hope our car will perform up to all the work we've put into it, and hopefully we'll, we'll win the top speed and endurance. This event has been really fun for us. We really enjoyed the experience of building the car, and it's given a lot to us over the past three years. And uh, the grand champion, 2017, Racing the Sun, and that team, congratulations. Please come and get this wonderful trophy, the number 11 team for center. Uh, <laughs> When I first joined, I had no idea that I would love it so much. Uh, they, they said, hey, we need a driver. You want to join? And I said, sure. And I ended up falling in love with it. And it was amazing. My teachers are so supportive. They're so amazing. They put so much time and money and effort into this. And I really appreciate what they're, they're doing for me. They're giving me an experience I never thought I could have. Med school is an intense four years. It is mentally and physically challenging. So how can medical students ease the tension? At the University of Arizona College of Medicine, a talented group of future doctors have come together to make the lives of young patients a little more joyful with music. If anyone's around, you know, you have to delegate, like you. Go, call, call 911. You, go get the defibrillator. If you're by yourself, pull out your phone. Put Med school is tough. First two years are really textbook information. What Alzheimer's and Parkinson's actually share. And of course you wouldn't see the this. The next two years, years three and four, are purely clinical. Yeah, breath, breath sounds are absent. So we're finally in the hospital, full time, rotating on different clerkships. You know, antitussives were... It's very easy to stop taking care of yourself during med school, and no one benefits from that, including your patients. Make you wonder, I wonder, over sideways and thunder. I need to do things that I really like during the week, because otherwise, the pressure will crush you. Sounds a little bit doomsday, but I, I, I truly believe that I'm correct in that. Okay, guys, let's do it. Let's sing stuff. Music can be a great stress reliever. You guys want to use pitch? <laughs> so every Sunday night, we'll come here into my house and sing together. How about this one right here? How about right now? My name is Alex Sandweiss, and I'm a third year medical student at the University of Arizona. The second one is always on And here. I'm the director and arranger of the aptly named musical group Dacapella. I need some fingers. So I, I played Heartache Tonight by the Eagles because it's the same progression as this. My first year of medical school, I had written arrangements for the group. And the next year I was in charge of the group and have uh, been in charge and writing the music ever since. Let's add bass. My name is Jim Dunleavy. I'm a third year med student. I pretty much sing whatever needs to be sung. That usually ends up making me a bass. Honestly, my favorite thing is just coming to rehearsal because I can mess up terribly. Mess up there. Okay, so, all, so actually all three of you are slightly below. And it is neither going to make them think that I am better nor worse. It's just whatever they've been thinking for the last couple of years. It's just a hair low. Okay, let's take it from that. What I actually like to call myself is vocal drums. My goal actually is to sound as much like a drum set as possible. An individual hi-hat and a snare drum and different toms, doom, 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 doom. Put it all together. I learned it on YouTube. He is crazy, like crazy good. It's a real percussive on those dudes, right? Some people don't have any music background or they never read music. So he's been doing a lot with our group. Give that little, that minor third. Composing, hallelujah. I'm Abigail Young. I'm a second year medical student and I sing soprano in the group. I've always loved singing. It's pretty big in the Filipino community. So when I found out that they had an acapella group, I was really excited. 
You know, we're all in medicine for a certain reason, but it's nice to see everybody show their talent outside of academics. And it's fun to work as a team and work as a group in a different context. Each person has to know their part and each part has to work cohesively together in order to make a great sound. Who outdrew ya off. In my opinion, it's, it's really cool when it all sounds great together. It's not somebody who's seen the light. It's a cold in me, it's a broken hallelujah. When we actually get to share that with the community, it's really cool to see everyone's reaction because it's like all that hard work that we've put into okay, it. Okay, then also ones. Gets um, produced yeah, into something alive. cool and neat. We're going to go to that open door right there. Yeah, the one that's open right there. I mean, sometimes they don't really know what to expect, <laughs> or they're like surprised, they're like, what the heck is happening? So we're new Disney. They're exhausted, some of them are doing chemotherapy, some of them are out of surgeries, or have certain you know, illnesses that really exhaust them and take all their energy out. Anytime we start anything, I'm weirdly stressed. And as soon as people are enjoying it, I'm having a blast. The hospital is a boring, scary place for just about everyone. Um, I can't imagine what it is for a kid. So just to have, even if it's five minutes of something that is more fun than lying in your bed and more interesting than the beeping of your heart monitor. I don't know if it's true, but it feels like it feels like a, a, a real contribution in a way that nothing else does. When you have a child in the hospital, the parent experiences this unbelievable sense of helplessness. I can show you the and this lack of control, and you just want nothing more than the child to momentarily forget what's going on. Can I get another high five? One more high five. Along those lines, studies are now being done using the more advanced and available measurement tools like functional MRI and PET scans. So we see now that music, a joyful, happy music, lights up the areas of the brain that are associated with happiness and joy and pleasure, uh, where dopamine is, is released and other neurotransmitters. And so there's a very concrete association. So what you're seeing um, you know, in the visual response or the physical, emotional response, the patient and the families is uh, now being documented. What happened right now? So when there's a moment, especially in a community setting, where people can connect and the, they see the children enjoying themselves, then they feel that sense of normalcy. Um, I think that's an incredibly powerful thing uh, that you can bring into the uh, very difficult setting. Thank you, guys. Can I just sing to her? Sure, of course. We try to bring the audience back to you know a particular happy moment in their life, and and we can tell you know when we start seeing the foot tap and, uh, and smiles on their face, we know that we're doing we're doing something right. Sometimes it's just nice to be able to connect with little kids. They're going through a lot for you know not being alive for that long. <laughs> When they benefit from hearing us, we benefit from performing for them. I don't know if necessary or needed is the works. I mean, clearly, if we hadn't been there that day, no one would have noticed. But I think when people are there and they're offering to give, hopefully give something that those kids really, really like, a void that might not have been noted previously is at least partially filled. Like what you see on Arizona Illustrated? Visit our webpage at azpm.org to watch and share videos from this episode. And you'll find everything you need to stay connected with public broadcasting in Southern Arizona. azpm.org.
The Rogue Theatre enters its 13th year with a provocative world premiere by a local author. It's the story of Celia, a slave, and her journey to break free of her bonds. The Rogue continues its tradition of challenging audiences with deep and soulful theater. We have this little ritual at the beginning of all of our rehearsals. We throw a ball around in a circle. One of the things that's really cool about that exercise is it's just fun. All right, hold your ball. I beg your pardon. I always tell the, the ensemble that fun is a professional responsibility. Freeze. Hold your position. Beautiful. And move. Joe McGrath and I started The Rogue in 2005. We decided that life was short, so if we want to do the plays that we would like to see, then we should, um, we should just do it. We wanted an ensemble-based repertory theater, and that's what we created. Beautiful. All right, great. You think you got that? We're a very, very strange theater company in that, in that we have no sound system in this theater. We've really kind of made that a sort of a religious commitment. It forces us to be a lot more creative. Destiny, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go stand up back. And so I want you to talk so I can hear you. The bad man put mama in a chain. So she was crying, you know? Theater is especially important in 2017 <laughs> because we are very disconnected. We don't have a lot of places for community to come together and experience important ideas and, and talk about important ideas. I'm not going to uh, lie to you. I was shocked at first. I was like, the rope is putting on this play. Slave rape ain't a crime. As an artist, I believe it's important to reflect uh, the times in which we live in. Um, I've never done a slave narrative before. I've always been scared, still am right now. I wouldn't be doing it if I wasn't scared. Round up four million of these black savages and, and throw them in. It's really cool just to sit down and not have any physical movement, just verbally hear the language. Some of it is very beautiful from some of the characters and the others are very haunting, as you can see through my face. Celia the Slave is a play that came to us a couple of years ago, actually. Um, Barbara Seda is a friend who we knew wrote this play, and she shared it with us, I, I think even before it won the Yale Drama Prize. Slaveholder, one of 12 white male jurors on Celia's trial. Great. Even though the play won the Yale Drama Prize, it sat on the table at every major theater in the U.S. for about two years. All those deals kept coming together and falling apart, and coming together and falling apart. Finally, Joe and Cindy invited me into their office and asked if we could do the play here, and I was thrilled. Be done with the troubles of this world. We have an amazing, uh, gifted cast that is multiracial and intergenerational. The youngest is 10, the oldest is 70. It may be the last time we walk together. I fell in love with it reading the first monologue, which is Jingo, a hog farmer, talking, just talking about raising hogs. Raising from birth to butcher, bacon, ham, pork chops, smoke butt. And talking about it in what are surprising, funny, crude, lively terms. Pop them across the snout. I started in third grade in a show called Beauty and the Beast. <laughs> I was the, the lead role of Beast. <laughs> <laughs> I'm playing the role of Celia, uh, and she's a very complex character. It's been a roller coaster, I'll say. I think I didn't really realize the weight of the character until, honestly, like, I think the first rehearsal. When I first read through it, I was like, man, this is sad. But when I actually had to feel the emotions that she felt, it, it took a toll on me, not negatively, but it definitely, it changed me and it changed my perspective. 
The play is based on an 1855 trial of a young black woman who was uh, sentenced to death because she had killed her master after being repeatedly raped for five years. This play is a tableau of interviews with the day. The salient facts of this story are, are, are all recorded in the, in the trial transcripts. These people actually existed. Fast up, girl! I worked as a journalist for many years, foregrounding the voices of those silenced by the mainstream. She said she killed in self-defense. There are all kinds of reasons that I disqualified myself from writing the play, and then finally, um, I just decided to write it. They ain't gonna vote where I live. They did. They control the government. Because I felt the story was so important, and as a journalist, I always felt not what I have the right to write about, but what do I have the responsibility to illuminate. Free and enslaved blacks are classified as persons with no constitutional protection. White slaveholders do as they please. There's no fear of penalty. Because it takes place in 1855, it's five years before the Civil War, so you can, you can hear the rumblings of the Civil War um, coming through the characters and through the play. Slavery is necessary and barbarous. They know there's a reckoning uh, uh, coming and they're desperately trying to uh, fight against it. Throughout the rehearsal process, um, I at first was really reluctant to get into the character and just into this world because I knew how disturbing it was gonna be, but you know, I'm an artist, and in order to be true to the character, to the story, um, and also to the audience, um, we have to get into that. I was bully rag, tortured, accused of killing baby Virgil. My ah! character's really serious. I have to really act the part. While Max had a rope around my neck, made it real tight. We talk about it sometimes, and sometimes it just get like a like a dash of anger. Like we like, why did this happen to like my grandparents or like great grandparents and stuff like that? I just like really get mad at that and how they treated people like that. That she crazy, spun out. Just even thinking about going through as much as she's gone through is terrifying. They've acquired it illegally and intend to keep it all illegally through an illegal legal system. A lot of my white teenage friends, it's hard to talk about. I think they know about the issues of slavery. I think they're afraid to talk about it. Um, and I was as well. I was as well before this show. Counting the minutes and seconds of their future. That corrupting institution that this country indulged in for, for several hundred years has, has still not stopped corrupting us. I've come to understand our problem uh, better by working on this play. I hope that it highlights the, the collision of realities that existed pre-Civil War, the racist consciousness that existed pre-Civil War that you know, fed the slaveocracy that became the foundation of American capitalism that is still alive today. We're just really thrilled to be able to present it to Tucson because it's, it's an important work and it's an important conversation for us to have. I'm trying to get as many friends my age as I can to come to this show to kind of realize that it is an issue. More awareness and more invitation to go inside one's heart to heal bigotry, hate, prejudice, discrimination. Don't tell this story. I hope it reminds them that all the, the horrors haven't completely gone away yet. I'm quoting our director, Cindy Myers, who's one of the co-founders of The Rogue. She said, this is probably our most important play that we've put on yet. During his senior year at Pueblo High School, Dick Barber had 13 close friends and relatives die. As a result, he vowed never to kill another human being. That made him only one of two men during the Vietnam War classified as conscientious objectors by his Tucson draft board. Every male student at the U of A was required to take ROTC as long as they were a freshman or a sophomore. 
Everybody who takes ROTC has to, has to sign this loyalty oath. The guy's name was Major Wilkinson. And I said, Major, I have all kinds of mental reservations about how I'm going to defend the Constitution of the United States. I said, I love the United States, I love the Constitution, but I have reservations about how I'm going to defend it. He said, kid, sign it or go somewhere else. I couldn't go anywhere else. My dad had just died. Uh, you know, this is, this, is, this is right after Labor Day um, in 1960. Uh, my dad had just died a week before. I couldn't go anyplace else. I, I had no choice. And I looked him right in the eye and I said, I want you to know that I am going to perjure myself and you're a witness to me perjuring myself because I have all kinds of mental reservations and I'm gonna sign this thing. And he said, that's good, you're gonna be in my class. I have to say that even after 55 years, I really respect the man. Um, and every, every, one of the military teachers I had, I thought were exceptional people. Um, ever since that experience, I've had a lot of confidence in, in our military leadership um, because they were, were really, I, th I think, very good people. What are your memories of the Vietnam War? Maybe you or someone close to you served, or maybe it impacted your life in a different way. Share your story with us by visiting our website, azpm.org slash Vietnam. Watch the new AZPM original documentary, Arizona and the Vietnam War, crafted from the personal stories of those who served in that war that defined a generation. Also in September, Directors Ken Burns and Lynn Novick tell the epic story of the Vietnam War as it's never been told on film. A 10-part, 18-hour film series, The Vietnam War, both premiering September 17th on PBS6. Thank you for joining us here on Arizona Illustrated. I'm Tom McNamara. See you next week.